Your song needs great mastering if it's going to sound professional, appropriately loud, and ready to be released out into the world. There's loads of good tips, techniques, and long format videos all over the internet to help you with this, but what I realized was missing was a simple framework or repeatable system that you can use to pull all of these tips together and get consistent results. So what I've done here is broken down the mastering process into a five-step system or less, depending on the genre. Each step only takes a few minutes, should take around 20 to 30 minutes to have your mixes sounding excellent, and you can apply any tips or techniques that you may have picked up from other videos or your favorite engineers, as this system is quite flexible in the middle. But as always with mastering, the most important thing is your listening environment so that you can hear the changes you're making, your attention to detail, and your mindset. If you're willing to learn, adapt, and also have a bit of fun through this process, then you'll have no trouble getting great sounding masters. Ideally, you can save this video and watch it alongside your mastering process. That's probably the best way to get the most out of it. So let's get right into it. All the tools I'm using are linked in the description, and I want to clarify this is not a sponsored video. It's best to work from a stereo wave file of your mix, so if you've got a big session, bounce that down and pull it into a clean session for your mastering. It gives you the least possible issues in later stages. You are going to need to use a loudness meter, such as this free one from Yulene. Usually, a mix that's ready for mastering is averaging around minus 15 LUFS integrated, with the true peaks hitting somewhere between minus 6 and minus 1. The next bit's really simple. We just sit back, relax, and listen to the full mix. If there's any unwanted clicks, pops, or issues with the volumes changing too dramatically, then it's probably best to go back to the mix and sort those out. Don't beat yourself up or stress if you're only hearing these for the first time as you start the mastering process. As you get out of the production and mixing mindset and just see the bigger picture of everything, sometimes issues crop up and you, you can't believe you hadn't heard them before. And this is why people are on, you know, Final Mix version 17a. That's normal. It's just a good thing that you're picking up the issues now. Now, 99% of the time, this is not going to cause an issue. But if you look at your waveform and you see that there's visibly significantly more energy above or below the center line during the loudest parts of the song, this is called waveform asymmetry, I might apply some polarity rotation to either the mix or an individual track or potentially the whole master. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with an asymmetrical waveform. It's not something you should be at all scared or worried about. But if we're going for maximum loudness, you can see that these peaks are going to cause a limiter or compressor to trigger unnecessarily. You can see the gain reduction on those loud peaks. After correction, with no audible change, you can see that there's a few dB less gain reduction during those parts. So this gives us both more loudness and less compression, which is usually a win-win. I would rather fix any phase issues within the mix, but I know many mastering engineers who happily apply phase correction to the full song, even adaptive phase correction. If there's any sort of audible difference to the transients or stereo image, then something is going totally wrong and you should go address it in the mix. When we're done here, just load the song up in your DAW and work at the same sample rate and bit depth as the mix. Just add around 200 milliseconds of silence before and after your track and add appropriate fades to the start and end of the mix. So this is where things start to get really fun. So the first bit is some corrective EQ. A little bit of subtractive EQ can clear up some sonic congestion and also tame harshness in the mix. Myself and others like to use dynamic EQ here, where a narrow filter is triggered when the energy in that band exceeds a threshold. But any EQs with mid-side and left-right filters are going to work, because we want to be as selective as possible. So some tips to help you with this. I like cutting and sweeping. I think it's an excellent technique with EQ. If you sweep around and the mix sounds better when you remove some frequencies, then you're probably onto something quite good. Now, there are no rules, but in general, small amounts of processing really add up. So even a 0.5 or 1 dB cut is likely all your mix needs. If you're consistently cutting 2, 3 or more dB, then it's probably an issue that needs to be addressed in the mix, or maybe there isn't an issue at all and you're just over-processing because different is starting to sound good. Next tip is that it's not essential to use linear phase EQ. People really go crazy about linear phase EQ 
most of the time it's just going to introduce unwanted pre-ringing to your sound but if you're using a lot of mid-side processing then linear phase eq is probably a good one to reach for as it can help the signals sum back up uh, with a little bit more cohesion next tip automatic resonance suppression might seem like a great idea but honestly it can be quite disastrous during the mastering process if you use tools like this remember they have no way to determine what's good and bad so you have to tell it what to do confine it to a certain band of frequencies that you think are a problem and then just make sure that you dial it in finally a high pass filter can be used to remove unwanted inaudible sub bass but never do anything without a reason or a purpose it will introduce some phase rotation but the benefits of increased headroom might outweigh the drawbacks you could use a low shelf to minimize those phase issues sometimes plugins just misbehave and having the high pass there or the low shelf can be a good safety net to make sure nothing's getting through to the master that you don't want to be there now we're on to the second part of this processing which is the tone shaping eq compression and any additional effects and tips and techniques that you've picked up often engineers reach for analog style eq here there's so many different flavors and types of eq you could choose we can't see the curve that's being generated so we know that the adjustments we're making are only based on what we're hearing and that is really critical you don't want to be adjusting an eq and saying oh that looks about right you just want to be listening in if you've got a bunch of other songs in in your genre you can listen to those and then go back to your mix and notice if yours sounds like darker like there's less treble or maybe yours has too much bass we can subtly nudge the mix in one direction or another maybe we want to brighten the sides of the mix or we want to adjust the vocals just in the middle of the mix so using the mid side left right we can be more selective and less destructive to the whole mix compression is also used here to create what many engineers call glue which is a bit of an odd term it sort of means cohesion so we're pulling up a little bit of the low material holding the peaks in check just creating something that sounds a little bit more cohesive a little bit more glued the biggest compression mistakes during mastering are not using a sidechain filter and having the attack set way too fast full mixes typically have a lot more energy in the bass using a sidechain filter means that the compressor is going to listen to the mids and treble a bit more it tends to give you a better rhythm to the compression so generally a slightly slower attack medium fast release times sound quite natural without squashing anything too much you only need a few db of compression at this point this is also the time to apply any other techniques or tips you've picked up along the way maybe you're trying out a new plugin you want to address something with saturation stereo image whatever you think sounds good just go with that and if at this point you feel like you're just going around in circles you don't know what to adjust there are some tools such as tonal balance control reference and other visualizers to help you check the balance of your music i think your own taste should always guide you but these tools can make sure that you're not missing anything or just that you're not completely off because of your listening environment this next step is where you have to make a big decision so based on your genre your taste and your commercial goals for your music you have to decide how loud you want your master to be it can either be dynamic and open super loud and squashed or somewhere in the middle now if loudness doesn't concern you at all you can actually just skip to step five and only apply a few db of limiting at the end however if we look at some chart topping songs and i've run these through my loudness analyzer it's clear that the loudness wars are over and loud has won most songs regardless of genre are objectively ludicrously loud often reaching minus five or minus six luffs short term and often exceeding zero db true peak literally no one at the top of the industry cares at all about the standards that spotify apple music or others are putting out and i'm not necessarily saying that's a good thing it's just that spotify is terrible at loudness normalization it's 2023 and it's an absolute shambles to be honest and i'm not negative about almost anything these standards have been set for years and they're just not working but i don't want to be overly negative to spotify if i go to apple music here you can see this is with volume normalization active you've got short term and even average luffs going way above minus eight minus seven whether you're on computer phone web app tv 
they all seem to behave a little bit differently. Rant over, instead of complaining about that, what I suggest you do and what I see a lot of professionals doing is simply choosing the loudness where the song sounds the best, which is usually somewhere in the middle between very dynamic and completely squashed. So to achieve that sort of loudness, we need to reduce the dynamic range step by step. We can't leave it all to one processor or it'll be overloaded. So we'll first use some compression, gentle peak reduction, which means we want faster attack and release times, cut down at least one or two dB during the loudest parts of the song. Now, after that, we're gonna use clipping. This clips the peaks of the audio, introduces saturation, and helps us increase the average loudness. Hard clipping introduces a large amount of distortion, which is why soft clipping with less distortion is generally favorable. Set the ceiling at minus one dB and push the gain into the clipper until you're getting one or two dB of gain reduction at most. I'll then use a transient shaper to selectively bring some of the transients back. This might be helping a snare drum cut through or giving the bass some more shape and punch. The final step here is about getting your mix up to an appropriate final loudness. We're gonna use a limiter to do this. Unlike a clipper, a limiter is trying to reduce the dynamic range with as little distortion as possible. So if we look here, a quick comparison, that's some gain reduction with a clipper, lots of saturation added, whereas the same amount of gain reduction with a limiter, you can see very little audible saturation. So some settings to apply. I like to keep the true peak ceiling below minus one dB. This gives the exported WAV file some space and some headroom when it's inevitably encoded into a lossy format. Your final limiter should have lots of controls. It's important to be able to select different algorithms, set the attack and release, adjust the look ahead. This is all crucial to make sure that you don't have any audible issues with the limiting. Most limiters work by pushing the gain into them until gain reduction is applied, and this is how you get the average level up. Now, most people should be easily able to get a mix up to minus eight or minus 10 luffs without causing really any audible issues. If you want to go beyond there, you know, to minus six, minus five short-term luffs, that's when you have to start making some sacrifices, maybe over compressing the bass or just compression in general. Basically, you have to make a trade-off between things sounding as good and open as possible or sounding as loud as possible. This is why I prefer not pushing those last few dB unless a client or a mix really does require it. Finally, we've got to export all the different file types we need. Set your dithering at the end to 24-bit and export at a 24-bit 44.1K or 48K WAV file, just depending on what your original mix was. This master will be ideal for digital distribution, but if you need other formats, MP3 or 16-bit, then you can simply render out those depending on your needs. So that's the processing done, but it's this next step that really stimulates growth and makes sure that you're getting consistent, great sounding masters. So take that final file, drag it back into the session, mute the effects, turn the volume of the master down and compare it to the original mix. So if you can compare them and identify any things in the master that you don't like or that you do like, this is how you start learning and getting better. Maybe you've over brightened the mix or it sounds too bassy compared to the original mix. As long as you can be honest with yourself, that's how you know you're gonna keep getting better. I personally never assume that anything sounds better just because it's run through my computer and my speakers. I think it's an important step for all of us to do, whether this is your first week or your 20th year doing mastering. I just think it's a fantastic process. Make sure we're still learning and always getting the best results. So that's the five step system. I'm pretty sure you won't be able to go wrong if you follow the, the basics of those steps, but there's loads of room to apply your own tips and techniques too. So let me know if that was helpful and also what you'd like to see more of in the future too. Bye for now.